Again, I'm pleased to stand before you to present uh, this lesson. I think I presented this lesson about eight years ago. So those of you that are old enough to remember, you're too old to remember. <laughs> so, anyway, we, we are in the Lord's Army, uh, or so the uh, children's song goes. There are other songs that affirm the same idea, soldiers of Christ, arise, stand up, stand up, you soldiers of the cross, and so on. <clears throat> and so we are, soldiers of the cross. It is undeniable that the Bible describes us as being engaged in battle. It's a spiritual battle. Paul was recorded in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, as saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In Ephesians 6, 10 and following, Paul describes the whole armor of God. Armor equips one to engage in combat. But Paul goes on to say that this fight is a spiritual one and that the army so described is particularly suited to this spiritual warfare. Who is the one, even among the secularist and the humanist, that will deny that we are presently engaged in a great societal and moral contest that I say is largely unrecognized as a battle of spiritual enemies. Recognized or not, that is where we are today. It does us little good as a society to excuse our moral slouching towards Gomorrah by noting that other societies are or were far worse. It is akin to excusing one's sinful conduct by pointing out the grievous sins of others. We will be held accountable for our own actions, irrespective of the actions of others, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. There are many epic battles recorded in the Old Testament. It is always a case of good against evil, as God defines good and evil. Chapter 17 of 1 Samuel is the story of David and Goliath. When we think of that story, we consider mainly the confrontation between the two, the sling and stone, and David's unlikely victory over a giant. The battle narrative covers only a few verses out of a relatively long chapter. Goliath epitomizes all that man could offer. He was big, strong, and very intimidating. And then there was David. He was but a youth, not even as big as Saul, a big man in his own right, although much smaller than Goliath. David represented all that God could offer. And we know the outcome of this epic battle. We think of this confrontation as the battle, as if there was only one battle. But there was another battle of importance, perhaps more important, even if not quite as dramatic as the battle. That other battle was David's battle just to get to the battle, for it was an uphill climb just for him to get in the position to face Goliath. Along the way, he had had to overcome spiritual and societal, social impediments to the accomplishment of his mission. In our battles as soldiers of the cross, we face and have faced the same opponents David faced just in the effort to get to the real battle. These opponents are in the, in the home, among our friends and brethren, within our government, in short, in places we would often assume to be friendly and supportive, or at least, at least not adversarial. And yet, they turn out to be the real problem. Let us look at the examples in 1 Samuel chapter 17 to see the forces 
impeding David in his impending battle with Goliath and how he overcame them. Let's set the stage. The narrative of 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 1 through 11 reads thusly. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together in battle and were uh, gathered at Sukkah, which belongs to Judah. They camped between Sukkah and Azekah in Ephesus, Daman, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's, weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If, he's, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This was clearly a test of Israel's faithfulness. The Philistines were represented by Goliath as the epitome of what man can offer. In the person of Goliath, the Philistines are saying that they need no one else, that there is no higher authority than themselves. As for the Israelites, they, including Saul, were dismayed and greatly afraid. They had no faith. They had forgotten what Moses had told them long ago, as recorded in Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 4. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the, you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, Today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart be uh, faint. <clears throat> do not be afraid and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Now Saul was big, but the other guys had an even bigger guy, much bigger. Israel cowered before the giant, and Saul trembled. Goliath continued his taunts for 40 days. And 40 is a number, uh, if you study those numbers, is a number that repeated throughout scriptures to denote a period of testing or trial. This was a test that Israel should have met specifically by not fearing, because God was on their side. But Israel failed miserably. This was not their first time to fail, nor would it be their last. At this point, David entered the scene. He had been conscripted, conscripted to work for Saul, but not full time. Even while David was in Saul's service, he continued to make periodic trips to home to make sure that his shepherding duties were fulfilled and care for his aging father and 
and uh, he, he would also obey his father's commandments. His father instructed him to take some provisions to his brothers in the camp and to bring back a report of their status. David not only performed such lowly tasks without complaining, he rose up early in the morning to get them done. Yet he also did not neglect his sheep, but made sure someone was there to tend them. Even though David had been given a prominent position in the royal court, he did not neglect his duties to his family or think of himself as above performing menial tasks in caring for lowly sheep. David's humility and servant-mindedness can be likened to that of Jesus. In writing to the Philippians, Paul had this to say, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 through 8. <coughs> Although the task at hand may be low, lowly and fraught with peril, God leads his faithful servants to victory. Such was the case with David, but it was not a kickwalk. There were many obstacles along the way. The first obstacle was uh, other people's disobedience. Here was the impact of other people's disobedience. Perhaps in consequence of Paul's disobedience and failures, the Philistines had gathered for battle in opposition to Israel. The situation had remained static because of Israel's lack of faith in the delivering hand of Jehovah. It seems then that Goliath was a beast of Israel's own making. Yet David, one of the few faithful people in Israel, was impacted by it and was thrust right into the middle to deal with it. This disobedience included other people's inaction. As previously noted in Deuteronomy the chapter 20, God specifically uh, or specified how the people were to engage in war at this point. But here they sat. Once Goliath revealed himself and taunted Israel, the Israelites were frozen in fear. They would not move to confront him. They, including Saul, sat paralyzed for 40 days and did nothing but shake. Saul even put out an extraordinarily rich bounty for anyone who could kill Goliath, but no one would volunteer. That is, no one except David. The enemy was certainly emboldened by Israel's inaction. Another obstacle may be family pressures. Here we see David's brother Eliab treating him with contempt. Eliab knew that David had been anointed by Samuel as king over Israel. Perhaps jealousy caused him to react to David's presence on the battlefield with anger. He unleashed a stream of ridicule. This is reminiscent of the attitude that Joseph's brothers exhibited towards him. First, Eliab questioned David's presence on the battlefield. He indicated that David's place was with the sheep, and the battlefield was for real men, such as himself. He elevated his own self-importance by denigrating David's. Eliab also suggested that David not only belonged with the sheep, but that he was derelict even in that small task. He said, with whom have you left those few sheep? He spoke ignorantly, of course, not knowing that David had, in fact, made just such a provision. 
Of course, ignorance coupled with prejudice is not a satisfactory substitute for the effort of gathering evidence and correct reasoning. Second, he attacked David's motives. He said, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. It is an unfortunate but not infrequent tactic to malign someone with whom one is at odds, not with any genuine charge or argument for which one can be held accountable, but by accusing the other of some spiritual deficiency. Here, Eliab accuses David of deceit and of having an evil heart. People lacking any real case against those they, uh, often, they despise often manufacture one, and one which cannot be tested by facts is very convenient. Eliab further asserts that he knows David's true reason for coming out, for you have come down to see the battle. The implication is not that David merely wanted to observe, but to gawk and possibly see some gory battle and thus have some stories to tell. Thus he left his real duty to come sneak about the battle camp, but Eliab, Eliab speaks out of ignorance again. David came only because his father had commanded him to do so. He was doing nothing except acting in perfect, humble obedience to his father's directives. Although David sought only to honor God and Jesse, his father, his brother, brother impeded him with wrongful accusations and mockery. He derided David as insignificant and accused him of unfaithfulness, deceit, and pride. David brushed aside these accusations by asking whether a mere question warranted such an attack. Other obstacles are of human devices. David's earnestness and inquiry about Goliath had at his, at his heart the desire to glorify God and take away the approach, the reproach of the giant had brought upon Israel with his blasphemies. David asked, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This shows first that he was motivated, motivated by his faith in God more than anything else. Second, his expressions were an implicit rebuke of the people for why were they sitting there in fear? In response to David's question, a fearful and complacent people said, in essence, we've got your back, way back. When Saul heard what David was saying, Saul sent for him. David told Saul that he would do what any faithful Israelite should have done in such a situation. He applied Deuteronomy 20, chapter verse 3, let no man's heart fail because of him. David relied on his faith and trust in God's promises. But David was still surrounded by others who did not have such faith. In this case, particularly Saul, as would be expected, Saul judged the situation purely by outward standards. David was too young. David was outmatched. David had no experience, whereas Goliath's whole life was steeped in battle. In short, David was treated initially as a youthful and zealous boy, but naive to the point of delusion. David overcame these objections by recounting his own experiences in killing large, ravenous beasts, lions, and bears, while keeping watch as a shepherd. Apparently, shepherding is not all harp strings and watching grass grow. There were certainly inherent risks to life and limb. Saul's argument was based upon size, strength, and experience. Nevertheless, he had to acquiesce upon such evidence. Regardless, he did not have any other volunteers to fight this beast. 
Saul's concept of how Goliath should be approached placed reliance on human devices. He clad David in his very own armor. It was just one more expression of trusting in the devices of men rather than God. Saul's concept of how Goliath should be, should be approached placed reliance, sorry, I missed that one. Saul's armor was not a help but a hindrance to David. He would likely have gotten himself killed had he had gone ahead and uh, with them, and he almost did. He started to go, but he realized at the last moment that as appealing as such armor uh, may have been, he was just not right. He confessed, I cannot walk with these, and for I have not tested them. David was not trained in these. He had not proven them. He was not comfortable with them. He would not pretend to be something he was not. When he killed those beasts as a shepherd, had he needed Saul's armor and sword? So why place special trust in them now? No. David would go in the form in which the Lord had prepared him, even if it looked unfit to the world. David shed Saul's devices and approached Goliath as a mere shepherd. For the battle is the Lord's, and it shall not be won by trusting in the devices of men. So what may we learn from this? As we go through this life working, learning, disciplining ourselves, glorifying God, and serving in the kingdom of God, our lives are constantly intertwined with those of other people. Whether we like it or not, some, maybe most, of those other people are impediments to our faithful service to God. This means that our efforts to be faithful will encounter the annoyances and per perturbations resulting from other people's sins, and maybe our own as well. Of course, we may be guilty of the same, but if we annoy and perturb others, let it be in defense of the gospel. We must realize that here David was on the path to a battle that would literally change the course of history. He would vault him from a shepherd to national prominence. Yet en route to that standoff with Goliath, David had to overcome several impediments ranging from his own spiritually spirituality to sibling rivalry to being publicly doubted by his government, that, that, is, that is Saul, among other things. How did David handle this? The simple answer is with steady faithfulness. No matter what obstacle was thrown at him, he never took his eye away from God's will for his people. This steadfastness involved humility, and involved courage, and involved being prompt in answering all challenges with appropriate words or actions. We can learn much from the types of challenges David met and how he met them. And these lessons can, be a, can apply whether we are speaking to our father, brother, community, or the king himself. We should remain faithful in the small things. Jesus taught his disciples, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Luke the 16th chapter verse 10. David illustrates this principle well for us here. He has, had already been elevated to a high position in Saul's administration. And yet we find him caring for his aging father and even still tending his sheep. This was a young man of tremendous work ethic who possessed a humility just as impressive. These small things were the training ground for David's much. Massive trials lay ahead for David and he would hardly be prepared for them if he had not remained faithful through all these small things. 
In consistently conquering these, David was being prepared by God for the Goliath. The commanding of armies, the national spotlight, the assaults from Saul, the national judgments to come, and eventually the throne. In none of these things could David have succeeded had he not first honored God in the small things. So it is with us as well. It is not enough to talk about honor without talking about what constitutes honor before God. Just as James argued that faith without works is dead, so honor without works is not true honor. To honor God means to submit to God and to his word. Submission to God's word means duty and action. Another thing we learned, we need to ignore the mockers and naysayers. We saw David mocked and ridiculed by his own brother. From this we can learn that we who embrace the truth of the gospel and are determined to live by the same will be ridiculed for it. And this ridicule will come from those closest to us, from brethren proved by their actions to be false, and even from perfect strangers whose lives are found wanting by comparison to our godly virtues. You will be falsely accused of pride, hate, intolerance, and who knows what else. In the words of Peter, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, Blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. First Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 14. And again, we're not to trust in human devices. Finally, we see David putting off Saul's armor and simply trusting in what the Lord had provided. We must do the same. As we press ahead in our service to our king, there will be many souls who desire to clad us in their armor, thinking that the only defense we can muster will come from their own tried and trusted methods. We must not trust in Saul's armor or the chariots of Egypt. This is, of course, easy enough to say. Just as with Saul's administration, Whole nations can easily forget God's word and trust in human agencies alone. They will go confront their Goliaths wearing Saul's armor, and they will lose. We must not shape our world in fear of Goliath, but instead by faith in God. Many forces colluded to keep David from the real battle. Yet why did David make it to the fight? Because he did not give up. Even when those closest to him ridiculed him, told him he was wrong, and publicly maligned his heart and motives. It is easy to get discouraged when those we know and respect show us contempt and even denigrate us. It is easy at this point to leave such people so the devil to the devil and go our own way. That is how we naturally feel. I've tried my best, but you people don't care. And if you don't care, then I won't waste my time anymore either. But if we strongly believe in the truth, then we can never say we have tried our best if we ever quit on it. David did not. And his persistence in the example is an example for us today. Do not quit. Do not give up. Ignore the naysayers. Ignore the mockers. Ignore the liars and the cheats. Move ahead and press your righteous cause until you reach the momentous battle, the one that really counts. And if you die trying, so be it. You have served God. You have not feared man. As Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, Revelation 2.10. And the truth is that there is a big future for small, smooth stones. 
and for the people who courageously will them. hope this uh, lesson has been of uh, value to you. If there's anyone who needs to respond to the gospel's call for whatever reason, we want to allow that opportunity now as we stand and sing.